Hey there, and welcome to the Overcomers Overcoming Podcast. It is great to have you join us. This podcast series features those who have gained victory over a life encounter. With that life experience, we encourage those who are experiencing something that might seem to be insurmountable. We advance and encourage others by passing forward evaluated life experiences. We have three objectives in this podcast series. We want to encourage those who are engaged in any type of life encounter by offering to walk with you to help you gain victory over anything that might seem impossible. We want to share our experience to help you. Our second objective is to help you develop a confident resolve that there are multiple options to get past any life obstacle. It's a matter of thinking into the situation. Our third objective is to help you with critical thinking skills. If you are facing a dilemma resulting from a previous decision you wish you could reverse, we want to help you think into all of the facts and factors involved in making an informed decision. I'm Ron Cooper, founder of The Cooper Culture. I'm with my wife and business manager, Marty. Together, we are The Cooper Culture Company, who is sponsoring this podcast series. Today, we feature Bernadine, known as Bernie Dow, who was her husband, John's caretaker during his six year period of dialysis. Through Bernie, we learn about dialysis and her role as a caretaker. For those who may not be familiar with dialysis, she speaks of peritoneal dialysis in addition to hemodialysis, two terms the listener may not be real familiar with. But Marty, it's a story of dealing with what needs to be dealt with, albeit the diagnosis was sudden, but she says work with a nephrologist with whom you can have a very honest, meaningful dialogue. Marty, what are some other takeaways our listeners can gain from Bernie? This was very good. Bernie was able to talk to us, teach us, and show us her experience through the caretaking of her husband, John. It was a great lesson or a learning experience of what dialysis is all about, where you can do it at the home or going to a clinic and having it done. But she was really very informative about it. And it was when they found out, it was just, we'll do what we have to do. It's a great opportunity to learn about being a caretaker, but it's also an opportunity to learn from her life experience about possibly preventing what got John to the situation he's in. Let's listen and learn together. Bernie, thank you so much for joining us. Our listeners are going to be very interested in you as a caretaker with your husband who was on dialysis. Just as much of the story as you feel comfortable telling our listeners. We have a lot of listeners who might be facing dialysis. They may be at some stage of uh, kidney failure, not necessarily yet to dialysis, but Perhaps you can explain to our listeners what you as the wife of and caretaker for your husband, who was a dialysis patient at one point, just some of the things you went through when you maybe first learned and how did you prepare yourself? Bernie, thank you for joining us and letting our listeners know just what they can expect. Well, thank you for considering my input on this. I think it's important for people to know. At what stage, and maybe even how long ago, did you first learn, did your husband learn that he was having, let's say it was a kidney failure? I think it was about seven years ago, and how it happened, we were out in the car, and we had had a meal, and then he said to me, he said, you know, I don't feel well. I have a lot of chest pain. Well, we were by the hospital. And I said to him, well, you know what, if you have chest pain, we're not going to fool with this. We'll just go over to the emergency room and have it checked out. So we went over and he was, he was admitted and then um, spoke with the doctors and they said, well, we're going to keep him overnight because we have a lot of tests we want to run, etc. I went back the next day, assuming I'm going to check him out. And they said, no, we'll keep him one more day. And uh, when I went back the next day, we were waiting for the doctor, who was the cardiologist, to come out and 
tell us what his uh, situation, what John's situation was. And <laughs> he came in the room, and much to my surprise, he said, well, we don't have a heart problem, but you've got a really serious problem here. I said, well, what is that? And he said, your kidneys are failing, and you better get to a doctor really fast. So we were shocked. We were just absolutely shocked. We had no prior indication in the past years that, you know, he was having kidney problem, and he did get his physicals every year. So it's not a matter of ignoring his health. He always checked every year with the doctor, sometimes more than that because he was prone to other things and the doctor would check him out. So nowhere was it mentioned his kidneys were failing. So like I said, that was a real shock. And then our first thought was, well, this is, this is really serious. You're going to die from this if you don't get help. So we came home and we talked about it and he's, he's, actually had, I think, as well as I did, death on his mind. You know, you can't live without your kidneys. Got a name of a very good nephrologist, and we went in to see the nephrologist, and he still had a, some working of the kidney where he did not have to go on what they call dialysis to cleanse the system of the impurities. So we, I think we were doing that for maybe a year or so, and then the numbers kept getting worse over time, even though uh, diet was watched, everything that you could do to prevent it from, you know, outright stopping the kidney stopping function. So anyway, eventually that happened. And then the doctor then said that he would have to have a port put in, a catheter type thing put in so that he could receive dialysis. And at this point we were talking about hemodialysis, which was the transferring of the blood and cleansing the blood. And we had all the necessary surgeries done so that he could receive dialysis. So we started the dialysis. He just, his body just was not adjusting to it well. We talked to the doctor as to, you know, what can we do? Because we were thinking this is the only alternative and she had given us after a while working with her she had given us a little uh, dvd disc of explaining the peritoneal dialysis which is water-based and you don't have to go into a clinic area for four hours to get your blood cleansed you can do this at home and they would give you the training which i got and all the equipment they you know come to the house and they they showed me how to take care of using the you know the machines the fluids and keeping things sterile and we started then with his dialysis at home which he preferred was also cleansing his blood better is there necessarily a correlation between kidney failings and chest pains, or, or was that just something that he just happened to feel, chest pains? Yeah, I think it was a fluke. To tell you the honest truth, he had a meal, he probably really had indigestion, mm -hmm. which he was very, very prone to. He had acid reflux, so it mm -hmm. was not unknown that he would have these problems. So we really were anticipating the cardiologist was going to come in and say, well, you know, it was a bad case of acid reflux. Well, the surprise. It wasn't the heart, it was the kidney. So to a degree, it's good that he had the chest pains because had it not been for that, if he would have just come home and felt normal, you wouldn't have had any reason to get the blood test to determine the kidneys were at the point of failure they were. Was, mm -hmm. Is that a right uh, statement? Yeah, and, yeah I, th I think so, because he would have probably been, the year he might he had without being on dialysis would have been obliterated. He could have, you know, just plain out died from his kidney not functioning if he, if he didn't find out in time or got help in time. So I think, you know, yeah, it was a good thing. So what your reaction, what you, you were stunned, is that mm -hmm. the way to put it? That absolutely I shocked. Just absolutely shocked. Because he gets regular physicals and mm -hmm. you had no reason to believe None. anything other than good health. Now, I am learning of the term 
creatinine, I hopefully I pronounced mm -hmm. that correctly, in the blood test. Had he been getting blood yes. tests regularly and knowing the creatinine and so forth? And the yes, the doctor went over it with him. And in fact, is when he was told his kidneys were failing, first thing I did was go back in my files and pull his physicals, which I always kept a copy of. And it did not show for the physicals that I had that his le level was not correct. So it could have happened, say, from the time he had his last physical, and that was checked, to when he had the episode. Somewhere in that time span, the body went haywire with his, his kidneys. What was the approximate amount of time from when he had the chest pains until, do I understand correctly, he had a tube installed? Yeah, and two, a catheter. A catheter. Right catheter is a better term. Yeah. Uh, was that just a matter of a few weeks type thing? Well, we went to the doctor for about a year just keeping an eye on the creatinine. And then after that, she said, well, it's time. We're going to have to, with his numbers, that we're going to have to go get the catheter in. And we made arrangements. It was done like within a week or so. So at what point, looking back, did did you, I'm going to use the term, resign yourself to the fact that he will be on long-term dialysis? I think the day at the hospital, one of the thoughts that went through okay. my mind was death. Then, no, there's dialysis. I didn't know that that existed. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, it's going to be a probably a rough road coming up. At that point, you were resigned, uh, and I use the terms, you were resigned that his kidneys are irreversible. There's nothing right. you can do to make it better. We're just going to have to deal with what is. Is that a, a fair yeah. assessment? We were going to try to stabilize it, which we did, and then wait until such time that they gave up, the kidneys gave up and said, no, you got to have dialysis. And that's what we did. We followed the, we went to the doctor very periodically to be checked and followed her directives until such time it came where she said, no, you have to start dialysis. So we have to start that portion of it now. Now, is it fair to say that all of this is brand new to you, that uh, you've already said it for us that you had no idea that your husband was having the health problems he did, but then was it just a, a few weeks where you kind of, it was a cram course of learning all of this that if you don't do something now, uh, if you don't stabilize, it could be, and you, you were, did you put it all together well, in a couple of weeks? Yeah, I came together under the directive of the doctor. Right. When we went to the doctor, she started explaining to us where we were and possibly where we, we were going to wind up. And the possibly where we were going to wind up, how did you process that? Well, I think my nature was we're going to deal with this. We'll deal with it. Give me the information. Tell me what we need to do. John has to make the decisions. That was one thing I said. Not me. He was going to make them, but I would go along with him and do whatever I needed to do to fulfill his requests or wishes as he went along in this. And that's what I did. Now, I'm curious for the listener who, who may be wondering, as I am, if John were not alone, could he have done the dialysis on his own? Well, if he was on hemodialysis, yes, because he would go to a center. And the center there, they perform it. All he does is sit in the chair and let them monitor and do the blood exchange. Okay, now, see, that's important for us who are just learning about this. The hemodialysis is at the hospital or, or the clinic or yeah, the whatever. clinic yeah okay mm -hmm. but there is a home dialysis that there the catheter is here and you mm -hmm. just plug into it am i oversimplifying that well in a way in a way i guess over time it looked simple to me but then when he came home and was going to do peritoneal dialysis then he had, I don't know if they call it a port, the medical, whether it's a port or a catheter, but it's an, a hole in, placed in there and a tube placed in there. So all the, the line could be for the cleansing of the blood be put in that. 
Now might be a good time for me to give a little overview of what peritoneal dialysis is and how it works. Peritoneal dialysis is cleaning your blood using your abdominal cavity. There's no blood involved in the procedure. Dialysis fluid is put into your abdominal cavity through a catheter, and it sits there or dwells there for a couple of hours, which then takes the toxins that your body doesn't need out into the fluid. That fluid gets drained and fresh fluid gets put in after a certain period of time, depending on what your needs are. There are two ways that this can happen. One is doing what we call manual or hand exchanges, where it happens throughout the day, about four times a day. And the other is using what we call the night cycler, which is done at night, where you hook up to the dialysis machine at night and the fluid is put in and out of your abdomen while you're asleep. With the machine, there are also the fluid bags, and that becomes a little intricate because you have to know through the guidance of the doctor over time, you have to learn what strength solution is needed for the vitals you're getting from him. And that can be a very tricky thing to learn if you're somebody like John who went up and down and up and down. Some people are more stable, so it's sort of like the same thing all the time. You get different solutions and then work with your doctor so your blood pressure and your weight weight is a big factor in it because it tells you how much fluid you're retaining and how much is coming off and your blood pressure your vitals are very important to know in dealing with the dialysis be it hemo or peritoneal how long did it take for you and i'm assuming this mm -hmm. is between bernie you and john that you had to make the determination how much fluid do I take off of you? That you you determine yeah. that is that somewhat trial and error? I think so, yeah. But it also at the same time, I had a nephrologist who could be reached 24/7. I wasn't sure. Say the blood pressure was this, and we had taken so much off it at noon time, or you know whenever we had done it, and I was you know questionable about should I use. A, a stronger strength or a lesser strength because of the blood pressure, etc. She would guide me. So it wasn't where you're terrorized, like, I gotta make a decision and I don't know what to do. If I didn't know what to do, I had the doctor to call. And if not the doctor, I had to consult. Here's where I need help because I, I'm, everything you're saying is brand new to me. You had a, you mixed a solution. No, I didn't mix the solution. The solution comes from a company bag about that size and about that much fluid in it. Like I said, it comes in different strengths and you learn what those strengths are. You've got your lesser to your higher. That's um, the important part that between you and John and yeah. the help of, of a nephrologist, yeah. you, you want to stay within these limits of the low strength, high strength yes. kind of thing. Yeah. What keeps mm -hmm. him normal, what keeps his blood pressure Good, which is strolling off the blood pressure, the guide on that is how much fluid's being retained, how much is going off. So it's, it's this whole balance picture that you have to maintain and watching weight at the same time. And the weight is going to vary according to the fluid that's retained and not retained. So b before going home with peritoneal dialysis, you get one-on-one -on -one training with a dialysis nurse, and you're never sent home until you have a full understanding of what the treatment is going to involve. You're also given very specific orders of, of what needs to happen, and you work with your doctor to figure out exactly what you need, which is why peritoneal dialysis is so flexible, and it can be changed to what your individual needs are. Are you taking his blood pressure before and after the, I'm going to use the term dialysis treatment to make sure that everything is going well. well if we thought we needed to take it, we took it, but yes, I always monitored him. We always checked his blood pressure and he was a diabetic, checked his sugar, made sure everything was within the, the norm. And the norm was, you know, it was a nice window. So you had a great mindset, it seems. It is what it is. John is what he is, his health. We'll learn whatever we have to learn. We'll do whatever we have to do. Exactly. It's just the way it is. Yeah, this is it. What are you going to do? Right. You can't run and hide. You've got to face it. 
like anything else in life, you have to face it. You can't run. Were his dialysis treatments a regular time, X number of days a week, one day a week? How do you know? Well, the nephrologist guides you on that. And when he started with hemodialysis, it was three, three times a week. And then when he went to hemodialysis, we did it every night. And then we started because he needed, because of his numbers and everything, he needed to do it also at noontime. So we did it at noontime and then we did it at nighttime. I think I picked up on some terms here. There is a hemo, that's H-E-M-O. That's blood oriented. Okay. That's where the blood is, yeah. And then there's another term I think you used, I wasn't familiar with it. Is Peritoneal. That? Peritoneal. And that's water-based. And the other thing is, talking about the hemo, you can do hemodialysis at home, but I, myself, this is my opinion, it's better to have it done at a, clin at a clinic when you're dealing with the actual blood. I would not have been comfortable if it was cleansing the blood at home, but I was far better with the water-based, and that was just my particular preference. Does the dialysis treatment need to be done at a certain time of day? Did John's body, did his energy level wear down or is this something that it's, you, you just learn mm -hmm. what the timing of all of this, of the treatments are? Or I'm curious how well, you know. Well, most people I think who do the peritoneal at home try to do it overnight so then they can get up, go to work next day, that kind of thing. Like I said, everybody's different age-wise too. Yeah. Other health issues, some, you know, take to it better and they can do it and then get up in the morning and go to work and function well and some can't because they've got other health issues besides the kidney, which makes them feel weaker and worn out. So the peritoneal so, treatment can be done while you're sleeping? Yeah, and that's the way we did it. I assumed, thank you for telling me that, you and he were at the table together. Yeah. I assumed you had to be awake through all this, but... No, no. I would hook him up at night, and then we'd go to bed. And so all of this, the body, everything about this is self-regulating, if that's an appropriate term. The body's going to do what it's going to do, and then you have to regulate it through the through the fluids and whatever that, you know, that you're putting in. All right, so did John have to learn how to sleep with this? Oh uh, uh, yeah, we had a rough time with it for a while because the bells and whistles went off on the machine and we couldn't sleep. We no sooner get back to sleep and then bells and whistles would go off because something wasn't flowing properly and then we'd have to see what the problem was and then go try to go back to sleep. So we had a rough a rough time for a while with the bells and whistles. I call it the bells and whistles going off. It's just the beep beep of the machine telling you we're not draining right here, so you got to get up and check the lines and all. Again, uh, I'm starting out with a total blank slate. The bag is hooked up to, it's, it's electrically operated throughout the night, mm -hmm. so there's a pump of sorts. Yeah, yes, yeah, this machine that okay. we hook the, everything up to. See, one thing I was picturing is an IV bag, it just gravity drips in and everything happens. Well, that's, that's sort of, you know, what it's like. Because when he did it in the afternoon, we take one of the bags and put it on an IV pole, hook it up to his catheter that was in the uh, side, and that's what it was like. It drained in there, and one would take fluid out, and one would put fluid in, and that's how it worked. And we could do that on an IV pole, and then at nighttime, we did it. We laid the bags on the machine, one on the floor and hooked him up, and then he went to bed. John was on dialysis for a year, or was it longer than that? John was on between hemo and peritoneal, I think it was six years. John is no longer with you, am I correct? No, he died June 21st of last year. Was that ultimately uh, because of kidney failure, or, or was it something uh, more complicated? Or? Well, let's say they put on his death certificate that it was due to kidney failure, but, and I'm going to put a but in there, he was a diabetic, so we have that picture. All right, we have the kidney picture, but he was admitted to the hospital because he had pancreatitis, 
and they also found a mass on his pancreas. The cure for pancreatitis was you can't have food or drink. Everything's cut off. Well, he's on dialysis. You need to put fluids in. You need to drain fluids off. It sort of upset the entire apple cart of the dialysis because it's fluid-based and pancreatitis, no food, no fluid. That's when he went in the hospital. He had the, the pains and all and was diagnosed with pancreatitis. We were doing quite well with the dialysis, but it was when he went in the hospital that everything started falling apart and it was because he could have no fluid and no food and that they, they were doing hemodialysis. They put him back on hemodialysis. For the listener who maybe is getting regular physicals, regular blood tests, anything of that nature, and they learn over a period of time that their kidneys are failing, can you help the listener based on your experience with John of over six years? Is there anything a person listening to us right now can do to mentally prepare for this, or is it in hindsight, you wish it wouldn't happen, but hey, we have what we have. In the end, it's you just live with it. Uh, how would you help the person who's saying, I'm at that decision point, or I'm, at, I'm, I'm reliving the night you were at the hospital and you mm -hmm. discovered for the first time. Is there anything you can tell the listeners, here's what you can do to prepare for this unfortunate news you're learning? Well, when I look back, I would just say that even though it, it didn't work out that way, but you've got to go in for your physicals. You've got to take care of your health. A true, I look back on his and the creatinine didn't show at that point in time. The doctor can tell you your heart's doing okay, but that doesn't mean you're not going to have three weeks later a heart attack. And I think maybe this is, in, in John's case, this was something, you know, it was building up, but it wasn't detected at that point by the creatinine which is what we were going by. In hindsight, is there anything a listener can learn from your life experience? Is there anything that you and John could have done differently for, from a diet standpoint to oh. <laughs> avoid what the ultimate result, and ultimate result I mean now, the kidney failing? Everybody's got to watch their diet. And when you do get your physicals, they'll check your sodium, your sugar, that kind of thing. And, and you've got to watch that. When he was on dialysis, he had to watch everything. His potassium, we had to watch his calcium. I mean, all those factor in at that point. You have to watch everything, not just sugar and salt. I would say myself in the beginning, in anybody's life, you all, everybody should be watching sugar and salt because they seem to be the start of trouble. And then you've got all your other nutrients you've got to look out for because you've got to be balanced. And when you start getting out of balance, that's when your body gets into more trouble. Well, that's one of the things we're learning from a nephrologist uh, diet. You don't necessarily have to cold turkey stop anything, but you have to do whatever you eat, whatever you eat in moderation, such that you don't overdo on Right, if you anything. overdo, then your numbers are getting higher and that means your kidneys are going to shut down faster. So you have to follow what your nephrologist tells you because she also, or he also guides you on your diet because they're getting the feedback from the blood test. This is high, this is low. So therefore, you know, you might want to cut down on this, cut down on that, and then come back at another you know, reading for another month and find out, well, gee, you did a lot better. And it was because you cut this out or cut that out. So your nephrologist is the most important person. At least she, she was to me because she guided me. I didn't know. She's the one with the degree. Right. <laughs> and there's, has all the knowledge. I needed to suck that out of her and give it to me so I could keep him alive. And it worked really well for six years. It the two well. things I'm taking from what you're saying know your diet and know the know what your body is doing from a blood test those mm -hmm. are kind of the two big takeaways mm -hmm. from this yeah and you need to have a good doctor and a good doctor and one you can cooperate with not fight but cooperate so that you feel with the doctor we had i felt um we had 
an exceptionally good nephrologist took the time to explain in why you had to do this or that. And if you didn't get it the first time, she was more than willing to explain it the second time and if necessary, the third. Because it's not an easy, it's not easy, but it becomes easy as you keep, you know, going along and, and doing it and having dialogue with the doctor. That's very savvy advice. One of the reasons we're doing this podcast is to make the information easily assimilatable and to learn from your life experience mm -hmm. and take away from this what we can learn to do in the future. And many of us are not going to spend 10 years in college to learn to be a nephrologist. We just want to learn mm -hmm. what we need to learn to live a healthy mm -hmm. life. And the thing is, I think the main thing was for me when John became ill was to get the best doctor I felt we could get in the area to help us through it. I was very, very fortunate because my first doctor was the one <laughs> that we stayed with and we felt comfortable with. So like I said, we were, we were very lucky, but if you're never comfortable with your doctor, then you should look elsewhere. So don't fight them. They're trying to help you. But if you find you're fighting your doctor, then, you know, there's a question here that needs to be solved. Either move or, you know, start paying attention to what they're telling you. But we were lucky. The first doctor we had was the best. You would categorize the best doctor from your perspective as you're able to communicate well, learn from, and everything was, I use the term frequently, a progressive conversation. He yes. and she are very agreeable to talk with you so that right. you know exactly what you need to know. Right. And she was accessible. Yeah. That was the first thing. She had to be accessible. When you're going through this, you don't know when you have a question and maybe that question needs to be answered right now because you're hooking somebody up to a machine and you forgot something and you need to talk to somebody. There was always either the nurse or the doctor that was accessible. And that's the most important thing that I found to help me get through it with John. I was his caregiver. So I really, you know, he, he was like, well, do what you got to do. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, fine. <laughs> wow. Well, Bernie, on behalf of our listeners, I want to thank you for being very candid and very honest and very helpful to learn from your life experience. And we want to pass this life experience on to others. And thank you for being willing to share with Marty and me and our listeners. Well, I appreciate having this opportunity. And the one thing I, I didn't say that I want people to know is they are working on an artificial kidney and they have had some success with it. So there's always that hope maybe we can get an artificial kidney and that will really, I think, be something wonderful. Medical technology is always advancing. Yep. I know yeah. there's just so many things that are stunning to me that we're able to do, the doctors, medical staffs are able to do now that had something of this nature occurred as recently as five years ago may not have made it. Marty and I are very grateful to the medical staff, the medical technologists who are continually advancing. There's a higher percentage of us that are going to be lived to be centurions because of that. Well, John had six extra years and he got to see his grandchildren growing. That's what he wanted. He wanted to have that time and he had that time. So it was, it was very worthwhile. We were happy to have that time. That's what he wanted. So you're describing a good quality of life and that's very important to our listeners. The quality of life was at times, you know, difficult because, you know, some journeys you go on aren't always the easiest, but John had a, an outlook of where he just wanted to be with his family. And he knew this was the path that would keep him around a little bit longer. And he had six years he wouldn't have had otherwise. So he was thankful and I was thankful for it. And Bernie, thank you for sharing. It's uh, very meaningful to our listeners. Well, I thank you and I hope everybody out there might get a tidbit from this to help them along the road. You can likely determine from Bernie's demeanor she is a very matter-of-fact type lady. Well, she certainly did not want the diagnosis the doctor was telling her. And of course, John did not either. It was a matter of the two of them buckling down, so to speak, 
and just saying we need to move forward with what we have what we have we're learning is not reversible but we're going to have to go forward with what we have deal with what we have let's learn and let's make the very best we can of what we have to work with it's a very admirable attitude bernie has the attitude we will learn this we'll do whatever we can and she's very effusive with her praise of the nephrologist with whom she worked our plaudits to dr brown her dedication to health kidneys you can talk with any nephrologist to learn about kidney friendly food diets what it is that causes kidneys to deteriorate slow down and when you learn this early on you can stop the degradation of kidneys to deteriorate and you can by doing in moderation what needs to be done Dr. Brown is not the kind of person who would say you need to stop doing everything or anything you're doing, but rather once you know the effect of foods and various substances on the kidneys. Our purpose in this podcast is to inform you. We want to help you make decisions, in this case with Bernie as a caretaker, that everything that may have at this point turned your life upside down we can work with we can learn we can develop a quality of life that in john's case he had six additional years of life with dialysis and he had a good quality of life there were life adjustments that bernie had to make john made and they dealt with that as they needed to and they moved forward with life to have a great quality of life. I want to do everything we can to encourage you to learn about the diets, to learn about the kidneys. Many of us, Marty and I, were each of the type that we knew we had kidneys, but beyond that, we didn't know much at all about the kidney function, what it is to maintain healthy kidneys, but we're learning about that and we're moving forward with those things that we know. We hope we can warrant a five-star rating with this podcast series. We hope you'll want to share this podcast with your Facebook friends, your LinkedIn connections, your Twitter and Instagram communities. The more we share, the greater the information we will get out to inform people. We know that there could be, and certainly likely would be, a devastation of any diagnosis that your kidneys are failing and you need to take action to stop the further deterioration. But together, we can learn how, if you are the candidate for dialysis, what to expect, and if you're a caretaker, how best to work with that person who needs dialysis. But together, that's the operative word, together, we can learn together, we can support each other together. We can help each other with a quality of life and we can move forward in spite of a diagnosis that is far less than what we had hoped for, but yet the diagnosis is one that we have to deal with. And as Bernie did, she was willing to work with John to do whatever that life adjustments were necessary to live with and move out with and continue with life to have the best quality of life that was available to them. Let's work together, let's share, and let's advance people together and give people the best quality of life that we can. We look forward to working with you.